Hey out there, can you see me? Am I alone here by myself? Welcome to Reynolds Family Live Tasting. Um, most of you who know us know that this is kind of how I roll. Um, we start every wine dinner, everything we've ever done to honor the guys we work with, mostly from Napa, that are mostly from Mexico. So I have started every single wine dinner, every single tasting with a little toast of Penta tequila. Or tequila, but now it's Penta, which is ours. Um, so I thought, why break a great tradition? And those of you who are out there probably have a little bit of this around your home. If you don't, you should try this. Penta is a tequila that I made with a few great partners. There are five of us. Penta means five. So it's the first tequila in the world that has all of five Mexico's regions. The best place you can get this, this is my shameless plug to start this out, is to go to bountyhunterwine.com because they can ship it to just about anywhere. If you're in California, of course, you can hit pentatequila.com. But anyway, I'm not going to plug this anymore, but I do want to raise a glass for all of you joining us here today. Um, this is actually a Reposado, one of my favorite tequilas. I'm going to get a little down my throat so I can speak a little better, clear my head. Paul, would you like to? There are a few people in the background here. I do have a live audience. Would you like to have? <laughs> I, a, I would love it. I love it. I love it. I, love it. I, I don't like to drink alone. We got to keep our distance. So we keep our social distancing here. There we go. Awesome. Thank you. Cheers. You're welcome. Cheers. <laughs> Hold on. Let's do it official. All right. There you go. Keep your distance. So there you go. <laughs> All right. Let's start talking about wine. So. I got out some great stuff for you guys to try today. These are some new products, something that maybe you've never heard of. The first one is called Clear. Very, very in-depth going into thinking of this name. This is a clear Cabernet. Unique expression of Cabernet Sauvignon. Has anyone out there ever had a clear Cabernet? So, by the way, you can pepper in some questions here if you'd like to. We do have... James, are you there Look with us live? Absolutely. All right, cool. So, you know, every, every host has his Ed McMahon in the background. So we have a couple of them. I've got James Lovis, who works here at Reynolds Family Winery, and he's down there in case you guys want to shoot any questions in. Sound good? Any questions so far, James? Uh, nope, we're just getting going. All right. Some I'm great ones, though. Make sure you're still alive down there. I know you didn't get tequila, so I'm just making sure that uh, <laughs> that you're still awake down there. I mean, I'd like to run some down to you so you can be officially a part of this, but you'll just have to suffer with wine down there for now. <laughs> so, Very clear, damn it all. Say, let's go ahead. Sorry, what'd you say? I said, damn it all. <laughs> <laughs> so, clear was sort of a pretty cool idea, and the reason I'm starting with it is because it has a little bit to do with this tequila. Um, when we make tequila, there's a new classification of tequilas that are very popular right now called Cristalinos. And what Cristalinos are are really aged tequilas that have a little color. So a traditional Reposado would have a little bit of a gold color, just like a Chardonnay or a white wine would pick up color from a barrel. Barrels instill just a little bit of color on a liquid. So with tequila, the more feminine liquids like vodka, various spirits tend to sell a little bit better because they seem a little softer there. Um, people are a little less afraid of a clear spirit. So this new classification of tequilas came out called Cristalinos. And really what you do is you age a tequila for whatever it might be. It could be a Reposado, could be an Anejo, could be an extra Anejo, as much as three years or plus. And then we use a technique using charcoal to remove the color. Um, so, you know, kind of got my mind thinking about it and we tried a whole bunch of different techniques when we were making Penta and arrived at our own, actually our own sort of patented method that we arrived at. And I thought, you know, what would that do to wine? So Arturo and I making wines a couple of years ago decided, you know, wouldn't it be cool to see if we could remove almost all the color on a Cabernet? So we did is we actually took our estate Cabernet. So believe it or not, this clear liquid that's in here should be that dark, rich, ruby red Cabernet that most of you are familiar with. But what we did was we picked the grapes and we made it blush style. 
So when we make rosés, um, rosés are actually a red grape. If you take a red grape and you smash it, the juice comes out and your hand looks clear like water. So where all the color comes from in Cabernet is from the skins mostly, a little bit from the pulp, but almost all of it from the skins. So with red wines, we ferment the entire grape in a tank. Um, with white wines, we bring the white grapes in and we actually smash or press the juice out and just ferment the juice alone. So the color and all the texture of big red comes from the other things. So with a rosé, what you do is you bring a red grape in. It could be anything. It could be Pinot, Merlot, Cabernet, Zinfandel. Um, we bring those grapes in and we press the juice off and ferment it just like a white wine. And it's purely the action of going through the skins that pick up a little bit of that blush color, like your cheeks get a little blushed. So just that flash second of pressing through the skin creates that little bit of color and it actually picks up a little texture and character in that wine. So we try to get it off the skins as quick and as we can. Um, then we make it just like a white wine. This was actually made in all stainless steel. And um, from there, we just continue it down the path, leaving in stainless, not putting it into any wood to keep it very light. And after that, we used our charcoal method that we use on tequila. So I'll be honest, we were pretty surprised how good this was. And it's a little bit of a mind bender. So I'm gonna take a sip here, if anyone has this. I know some people purchased this at home already to try with us. Those who have not, um, I think live on your screen, is that right, Paul? There's uh, a way to click on, is that right, with a QR code? On yeah, the they, they got the QR thing. Okay, so there's a QR code that's on the screen that you can actually go up and use your phone. It'll take you live right to a purchasing method or a way to look this up with more information. In fact, the bottles all in the back of them have a thing called bottle bin, um, which Paul was the inventor of who's sitting right here. And it's a super cool way of learning more. And uh, there's actually a lot of cool stuff you can learn about this. Take a sip. Um, start out with actually the aromas on the wine. So to me, what we both, Arturo and I and the whole wine team here, we found very intriguing was right away just the aromas that came off of this wine super tropical, super lush, nothing like a Cabernet. I mean, to me, it would have been sort of a Viognier based, um, fun type of white wine. And um, it's just almost undescribable. It's a little, I hate to say bubble gummy, has uh, some real sweet candy textures to it. Hey, Steve. Yeah. So one question is, uh, don't the skins also provide structure and tannins for the wine? They do, absolutely. Um, so that's a great question. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the personality of a wine comes from the skins and the pulp. Skins um, are the second largest source of tannic acid. So tannins, of course, are an acid, but it is that thing in your mouth that adds that dry mouth feel, that puckeriness. And um, we are very careful in how we grow our grapes, when we pick our grapes. In fact, there are uh, classes after classes at universities on picking for ripeness. And a lot of it has to do with the development of exactly that, the tannin structure and the flavors. And a lot of you, and I've done a bunch of Zooms with people, so you might've heard some of this already, but um, picking ripe fruit makes a huge, huge difference. And um, underripe tannins from the skins, if the skins aren't ripe, or particularly the seed in the center of the grape, um, that's when you get wines that are very aggressive, and a lot of times you're told you need to lay them down forever. Um, that's because a lot of times the grape doesn't have the opportunity to get properly ripe. Um, just like anything, I know I use the strawberry analogy probably too much, but I think most of you have bitten into um, fruit and uh, or an apple or it could be an orange it could be a grapefruit but strawberries are very visual because they're bright red and how they grow and most of us have been into a strawberry field so getting a red delicious strawberry with the sweetness that's intact is really kind of what we're looking for in wine as well the astringency that comes through skins and the seeds um, 
can be very aggressive when it's underripe, almost that sour note and that drying mouthfeel. We like things a little more balanced where you do get a little richness in the mouth, but not something that's going to literally rip your teeth or your tongue out. Um, with this wine, um, I find it to be when it's cold, and I personally like to drink this wine cold. We get that question asked a lot is how would you drink clear? Um, I like it chilled just like my white wines. And um, I find what's really neat about it is the temperature completely changes the wine. So as it warms up, it becomes a little bit of a different beast. It's a little bit of a mind blower. In fact, this is the perfect wine to take into your favorite restaurant with your most snooty sommelier. And don't let them see the bottle, or let them see the bottle, because they won't know what it is, unless they read underneath here. But I guarantee you'll never get any song that will be able to pick this up. It's pretty cool. Um, it's addicting, I will tell you. Once you start tasting this, I'm going to tell you, it's habit forming. So. Well, you know, you didn't pour me some, so I need oh. some. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Because I've been telling you I'm describing it. all this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there you go. i got to drink some of it. <laughs> Um, but anyway, in the tasting room, we've noticed this summer that we brought this out and people are trying it. Um, this is becoming definitely one of our number one sellers and, uh, people are loading up on it. So hope you guys will try it. It's something just different, fun. And I think in the wine world, I mean, we're all out there searching. We all love to learn things. And I think that's what intrigues most of us, um, with wine, there's just so much you can learn. There's so many flavors and it's just part of the fun and getting involved food and wine. So this will be just one of those great friends over fun. You know, me and my cocktail facts that I like to joke around about cliff from cheers. Um, this is definitely one of those ones that would stump cliff even at cheers with his facts. I'm sure. So anyway, that's clear. Anyway, there's a good look at it. I'm going to have one more sip just because it's hot outside. 100 degrees outside. It is 100 degrees outside. Definitely the air conditioning is saving us right now. So I'm going to use the same glass. I'm going to reach over here. We're going to start into our second wine. Don't so me. our lovely matching label set here. That was designed by, yes, Steve Reynolds. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, anyway, this is our rosé. And this was made a little different. You're probably going to jump in on this oh, yes. early just because I did a party foul a minute ago. Oh, there you go. Um, so this is a little different and unique in and of itself. I've already described how you make rosés in making the clear. But uh, this, again, you know, kind of know me, most of you guys, that I like to do things a little different, challenge myself understand things and not everything you're going to pick up in wine you're going to get from a book um oftentimes i found at least when i was going back and taking wine classes that um most of the stuff i learned was literally on the job or actually having to work at other wineries and i picked a bunch of stuff up from other winemakers um this is actually the mix of predominantly merlot from our vineyard called persistence which is right over here on Monticello Road, just at the border of Coombsville, and 15% Pinot Noir. So the Pinot Noir was made um, with just completely ripe Pinot that we brought in, that we dejuiced the tank. So you actually take the grapes, bring them in, put them into the tank, and then after the juice and the grapes are all sitting in the tank, we'll actually open the valve and drain a little bit bleed off a little bit of what we call the free run juice. So the juice that leaks out of the skins right when the grapes are starting to break down, we get that off quick. A lot of times wineries will do this on big grapes, Cabernets, Merlots, to concentrate up their flavors. Um, a lot of grapes, um, we use what's called a skin to juice ratio. So some Cabernet grapes, Merlot grapes, they're all different sizes, a larger grape, will obviously contain a lot of juice within that skin. A smaller grape will actually have very little juice inside, so you've got a lot more skin to juice ratio. So what's happened over the last, I'd say, 20 to 30 years particularly, is a call for more. Um, we've all done it with everything in our lives, you know. Um, we went from 
you know, stereo to surround sound to vibrating seats, watching movies, all these things. Our cars are faster. Um, everything has gotten where we demand a little bit more. And wines are no different. So the way we can actually gain concentration in not only flavor, but texture is to do these little tricks. Um, and the good part is they're natural. So this is a way that a winemaker can just use natural things to increase intensity in a wine. And even with Pinot Noirs. Um, so we did a little bleed off the tank and about 15% of this is Pinot, but 85% of this is Merlot that, um, is a mix of using two methods. So we did the same thing on the Merlot, bled the tank a little bit to concentrate the flavors, but a portion of this was actually an earlier pick Merlot. So in certain seasons, um, we go through, there's a, there's a, time when the grapes change color. So you get what's called verasion. And verasion is where grapes, even red grapes, start out looking just like the white grapes and they have a little green color to them and they start to pick up color, start to turn purple. And you go through, when you go through the fields and things are about 95, 90% all have turned purple, you look for the stragglers. Like with anything, there's going to be weak links in the vineyard. So we will go through and a lot of times drop that fruit. So some years, Verasion will already have started to get some pretty good sugar concentration going. So in this particular case, we actually had sections we knew were behind and sections on the plant that were behind. So we let it hang a little bit longer, but we marked them. We came back through and picked those a little bit early. That allowed the plant to put all of its energy for the last, say, three weeks plus into the remaining fruit that was there. So a lot more concentration went into the remaining grapes for the Merlot, but we were able to remove those and make a lighter style Merlot. And again, made similar rosé style, but it was a way of not wasting material. So this is a mix of early pick Merlot to keep nice acidity that's natural, um, a bleed of a ripe Merlot that would have lower acidity and the Pinot Noir. So to me, this is a really cool mix of complexity, but just a brilliant rosé. Um, to me, that that early pick of the Merlot and the acidity is really what makes this one. So Merlots have become super, I mean, uh, rosés, I should say, have become super popular. Um, they've been popular forever in France and parts of Europe. I, I've seen the last 10 years, the spike in rosé. I think that's super cool, but uh, it's, it's a helpful thing for a wine team like ours, because as people have demanded more flavors with their big reds, it gives us an avenue to make these lighter, more fun wines and not have them either go into something that's not so good. It, it gets to stand on its own and be its own thing without waste. And uh, that's, candidly where most of our rosés come from. There are some rosés that are made specifically to be that way, but a lot of us have introduced rosés to the marketplace because of this concentrating of big reds and we call bleeding of tanks or de-juicing. What do you think, Paul? It was great. Um, hey, Jim, did you see that question from Jonathan? There's, he's wondering where to get Yeah, I think he's, he's asking Steve about uh, getting some wine out in the uh... – New Orleans, let me get the name of the uh, city. It is Lake Charles, Louisiana. Lake Charles, love it. So Lake Charles is awesome. How are you guys? Glad you're tuning in. Um, Lake Charles is awesome. If you guys haven't been out there, um, they've got some amazing casinos out there. Um, it's, uh, it's just a great place to go. And uh, we can, fortunately, um, you know, some of these wines our distributors don't have. Um, so obviously you can go to reynoldsfamilywinery.com and we can get you those. Um, but we do support, definitely support our distributors and our wine shops out there. A lot of them have been just kept us alive over the years. And for those who don't know, Louisiana was the very first state that I sold wines in. So before I ever sold a bottle of wine in California, um, a, a gentleman, an old friend of mine named Jacques Antoine had a company that he just started called Artisan, which is still in existence now. Some new owners, but uh, some of the team are still around from the original days. And uh, 
that was a very, so New Orleans, basically, not necessarily Lake Charles, but Louisiana, the state thereof, was uh, the first place that Susie and I ever sold our wares. And we've been going back ever since. It's definitely one of my favorite places on the face of the earth. In fact, they do sell Penta out there. That was also the very first state that we tested the waters to push out Penta to see how it would do. And thank you, Louisiana, for uh, supporting Penta. It's picking up really well. So we appreciate it. It's a great way to test the market. So. And we, and we love to hear about our members uh, sharing a great bottle. So uh, Bob Percival sharing a uh, 2011 bottle of persistence tonight well, during the tasting. Nice. Hey, Bob, uh, I uh, need to get out and ride dirt bikes with you. That would be super fun. But we can't drink and ride. I know it's been done before, but maybe not a good idea for, for us. Um, but 11, for those of you who talk vintages, um, 11 was one of the years that Napa had some, uh, I won't say shortcomings. It turned out to be a benefit in the end, but a year that we did have early rain. So one thing Napa's great for, just for, again, some more facts about wine and Napa and vintages, we rarely get it wrong in Napa. Um, year after year, you get almost embarrassed to say, yeah, another great year. How is it, Sean? Another great year. Almost, you feel like people are looking to see if you have a Pinocchio nose start to grow because, you know, we really do have pretty great years. I and mean, we have little battles that we fight. Um, a lot of times it's like a random rainstorm that will come in during bloom when the grapes are pollinating or it could be frost, these little setbacks, but nothing, thank God, that's been very catastrophic. But in 2011, um, the heavens opened up and just, it didn't stop. You know, we saw this weather pattern coming. A lot of guys tried to hold and, oh, it'll go away. We've had rain and harvest before. This one never stopped. And, uh, Trucks were lined up down the driveway with tarps over them. And it didn't matter if you were ripe or not, you were pulling your fruit. And uh, rain and mold can take a vineyard in 24 hours. So we were working nonstop. So we talked earlier a little bit about um, tannins and ripeness and strawberries and flavors of lusciousness. Um, that was a year that maybe the tannins didn't soften as much as they could have. You know, it is Napa, so we're going to get good flavors. We are going to get ripeness, phenolic development of sweetness and sugars and flavors, but maybe not to the degree that we would like. Um, but with time, some of these types of wines, and a lot of this would be more of a European style of winemaking, they tend to pick a little bit earlier, and oftentimes, again, because of their weather conditions. Sometimes they're faced with weather like that more often than we are. So they get earlier cold fronts or hail or storms that come in that force their hand to pick a little bit less ripe than we do here in Napa. So 2011 was a year that was definitely a little lighter. Um, but having said that, that means there's more acid. Acid, higher acid wines tend to pair a little better with food. So sometimes European style wines tend to be a little more food friendly. Sometimes some of the Napa wines, and I'm generalizing here, this is just for the broad stroke stuff, um, we make a little richer wines. Hopefully most of the Napa guys, I, like us, really pay attention to making sure we still have acid in our wines. But there are some wines from Napa that might be guilty of being a little big and rich. And those are great, rich, yummy, cigar smoking style wines, but sometimes they're not the best for pairing with food. But that 11 now should be showing pretty ripping about now. So it should be opened up pretty well. So, and if it isn't, hopefully Bob, you've got like about 20 more of them that you can open slowly over the next few years. <laughs> so since you are drinking something close, I don't have, I think you said persistence. I'm going to jump into our first big red, which is our estate Cabernet. Um, this is our 16 vintage, and the reason that we're trying this today um, is because this is sort of the last of it. We are just about to release our 17s, and 17 was a fantastic year again. Of course, the smoke was an issue for some people. Um, most of us, 90, 85% of the wines in Napa were off the vine 
by the time the fire sits. So not going to get smoke taint from us, but I do have a wine, which I think I've talked about on other shows called Ember. If you're interested in learning about what smoke taint is like, we do have a little wine that we bottle up about 120 cases of called Ember. Um, just for those that are curious, those again, well, you know me, you right. Try it, right? Try something new. Um, so Ember is something you might go on our website and check out. But this is our 16 estate. So this is the fruit that we grew. We grow right here on our property. These are the grapes that Susan and I planted um, back in 1996. Oh, yes. This is my favorite. <laughs> um, so Susie and I bought this property, for those who don't know our history, if you're tuning in, um, Susie and I came from other backgrounds. I was a dentist and my wife still is in insurance. Um, she's helped support my bad habits all these years from tequila to winemaking to, she would probably tell you other ventures as well. Um, nonetheless, uh, we're still here and so are the grapes. And so we bought this property. A lot of people don't understand that uh, when you talk about Cabernet, it's just a class of grape. There's not one type. There are many, many, many different types. So there's candidly over 500 different types. So, you know, anyone that would tell you they knew exactly what they were doing when they planted their vineyard, I would call BS on that. Um, in Napa, um, you have many different types of rootstock that we use to graft these types of Cabernet onto. So when you've got 30 some odd types of rootstock connected to 500 different options of Cabernet, you probably put that into your Texas Instruments calculator and figure that out. It's infinite. Then planting it into soil that never had grapes planted before, you know, it's pretty much a Russian roulette, roll the dice. But I think we got very, very lucky in using clone 337, clone 4, and a clone called the Weimer clone, which is very, very popular um, in the Camus wines. So we grow these three different types, and they play very, very well in the sandbox. I use that analogy a little bit for kids. Um, they just turned out to be great in how they combine in flavors. Now, we do add a little bit of Merlot to this. So as I'm swirling, I can already start to pick up some of the aromas that are coming out of the glass. Um, every year has been slightly different. Um, we actually started out for about the first five or six years going straight Cabernet, no blending. But then with time and I guess me, maybe evolution of my palate and blending and trying other wines from Napa Valley, Merlot just tends to bring a certain richness and helps a wine to become something more. And to me, adding somewhere between two and five or seven or eight percent Merlot, even more, um, you find just different things open up and there's a softness that occurs and it's called mouthfeel and texture. And to me, this softens that brightness of the Cabernet and uh, just brings a little warmth to it. So this is starting to show really, really well. A lot of times timing of a bottle um, can be a lot too. Um, it's, it's almost impossible even for me that makes this stuff and tastes it every day to give anyone perfect advice on when to open a bottle of wine. Um, I always use this standard phrase for our wines in the style that we make here at Reynolds with our team. And I usually say two to 10. And what that means is you know, try to wait at least a couple years after we bottled it um, it's just going to help the wine come together. Wines go through a little term called bottle shock. You can see the movie about it um, where they can be a little funky. And sometimes these molecules, these long chain molecules that we taste get broken apart and find their way back together. And the wine can evolve with time. And it sometimes takes certainly six months, they say, for wines that are filtered. And, uh, but I think it can take a little bit longer. It kind of depends, but two is a minimum. I think they drink great. Our style of winemaking, um, is to have wines that are approachable when they're young, but, uh, but evolve the time. And I think somewhere in that two to 10 year window, you're going to find your thing, but beyond 10 is also going to be a whole nother thing because a lot of wines, a lot of people love to age their wines. 
And a lot of times they like them when they start to get a little brown hue around the edge of the wine. And to me, that's a different beast. If you want to keep that fruit component forward, which I think Napa is known for, then uh, you definitely want to open your wines probably, you know, at least before 15 years. But I can guarantee you between two and 10, you're going to find some beautiful se sections in there for all of our wines. Whites and, of course, rosés are a little different. There's not as much structure. We get them right off the skin. So, again, the tannins that come from the skins, the acid that's in the wines are not as prevalent and uh, tend to not last quite as long, but that is a generalization. There are a lot of whites that do very, very well from aging. So how are we doing on time? Because I don't even have a clock here. We are at five o'clock. Perfect. Awesome. Right Any comments? We got a few. I don't want to just keep talking and rambling. Here, so <laughs> That's you know, not a problem. Better make it sort of like we're all supposed to be. Well, Jonathan it. wants to know where you got that Pentush t-shirt for, if you can buy those that you wore a while back. <laughs> <laughs> so the Penta swag, um, we're, we had a bunch of shirts made for the brand when we started in our original release party. My son, candidly, Cameron, has stolen, I think, all of my tequila t-shirts and taken them to Cal Poly. Um, so I think we're going to do a new reprinting of them, but I think that would be a great thing to go to info at pentatequila.com and throw that comment because I'm just one of five. I also agree we should have more Penta swag, great caps, T-shirts, et cetera. I'm with you on that, so I, I think we should have more. I'm going to make some more up, so hit me up and see if I can get you one. That would be good. Maybe golf balls. Maybe motorcycle grips, maybe motorcycle grips. I like yeah. that one. I like it too. Maybe some pads for the handlebars and stuff too. Yeah. Did yeah. you fall? So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so I'm going to take a quick second because I'm talking to Paul, the inventor here. <laughs> so on the back of these bottles, you're going to see variations. There is going to be a QR code that you can kind of see on this guy here which your camera would recognize. But you're also going to see on the back of some of these bottles, a little circular logo. So both of these will actually get you information on these wines. Um, it's a pretty cool app. Um, there's a lot of wineries that are starting to pick this up. There's a lot of products that are starting to use this. What's neat is um, it doesn't just take you to the website. It takes you to the product specific. And I think that's really cool. If you're sitting at a restaurant, you just want to know about this wine. For us particularly, um, we even have little videos that tell you a little bit about how we made these wines. Video of the winery, you pretty much can click on that thing and it takes you right over to the front doors of the winery. You can make an appointment at the winery. So it's fun and it's also a social media app. So people are starting to share their wine experiences with other people on there. Um, there's stories written by winemakers ourselves as well as others. So anyway, just again, I know I'm plugging stuff, but uh, you know, if you're not familiar with some of this new technology, I think it's pretty cool. Um, I think even uh, like Nike's putting in their jerseys and stuff. Yeah, so Nike so put them out retail. Um, Polo retail, just put them on all their clothes. So, so just letting you know, hey, we're a little Reynolds family wine. You're cutting edge, man. You got nothing on us. There you go. So I'm saying. So, and by the way. Again, Penta Tequila is also on there because UPC codes can also be recognized. Yes. So it's very, very cool. So anyway, all right. One more sip of this because it's so darn good. What I will do is as we're going to move into the last wine, um, I want to, for those who have never heard our story and wonder about our labels, I think most people that are out there listening right now know a little bit about it, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the mustard as we're on to that, the mustard flower that's on the front of all of our wines. Um, that was something that, uh, you know, when you start a winery, that's a very difficult thing is to come up with your identity. Um, who are you and, and what is your logo or what is your sign or, you know, what are people going to recognize about you? And uh, so Susie and I were in a card store looking to give a gift to somebody and we saw these cards that actually had a dried mustard flower 
and a lady had just written in calligraphy, very simple handwriting. It just said Napa Valley, 1994 or whatever it might have been. It was just very beautiful and very simple and very elegant. And uh, so we both saw that and thought, wow, how cool is that? So at that time, we were making virtually no wine at all, a couple barrels. So the idea was, excuse me, what if we actually glued a real flower from our vineyard onto the bottle? So that's where this whole mustard thing came from because um, fl these flowers grow wild in Napa Valley and there's a whole bunch of things that uh, honor that, including a restaurant by Cindy Paulson called Mustards, most of you know about. But this is sort of, uh, got one actually here. This is actually a bottle with a real pressed flower on it. But when we actually had this idea, you always have to have something that you use as your model or your mannequin. This was me, I think on an old Xerox photo machine where I actually put a real flower on the photocopier and then printed up Reynolds Family Winery and tore the edges. So. We took that to a uh, marketing company here in Napa, which I won't name names, and virtually kind of got laughed out of the office that uh, you know, they, they said that we were putting a feminine object on a masculine Cabernet, which was complete marketing failure. And, uh, but we stayed our guns and decided, you know, hey, I feel this is kind of cool. And uh, you know, to me, I thought it was elegant. And my mom had told me one time or some saying, I think it was like, Things that are simple and elegant will always stand the test of time. So we've stayed to that for years. Um, we still, to this day, um, hand glue real flowers on every bottle. But there is an exception, and that's going to be the last wine that we're going to start tasting here in a second. Um, one thing when you make real flower labels that you might not anticipate is guests, uninvited guests at wineries. Mustard only grows wild in January and early February. And so you've got to pick your entire year's worth. So if you're making, you know, 300 bottles of this stuff, multiply that by 12. Um, you know, so you're making thousands of these things. And they're all handmade, so you don't always get them on all at once. You have to store them, come back to them, hand apply them when you have time. So we store them in Tupperware. And... Uh, we found a critter that decided that it could get into our Tupperware. So we have now the little last little bit of our 14. And that's why we're showing this today because we're going to soon again, like with it, the state cab, we're going to start releasing our 17. We're going to start releasing our 15. We age the reserve a little bit longer and store it before we sell it. So it's always a little bit behind. But these are printed, raised, pressed so it's the last of a small palette we have left of what I call the collector's item because the flowers that should have been on this were ingested by a lovely little critter, well, lovely little mouse, mouse that's very fat and happy right now. But anyway, that is a printed version of the real flower, but that's kind of a cool story. Um, not one that you would anticipate. You want to try Paul? Of course, the reserve. So this comes from a different region of Napa Valley. For those of you who don't know, Napa is divided into different growing regions. And um, we call them Appalachians, sub-Appalachians. And within Napa Valley, we actually have over half of the world's different growing conditions and soils in this small little tiny valley. And uh, one of the most well-known regions is called Stag's Leap District. And Stag's Leap is an area that sits almost middle of the valley, and it's just a raised little hill. Um, and there's a term that was written about these wines. It's the um, iron fist in the velvet glove, because the wines are very intense, but they have a way of showing themselves eloquently. And to me, this is just a classic example of that style of wine. Um, it is candidly my favorite region in Napa Valley to make wine from because of the red fruits that come out of there. Um, very bright cherry, very uh, middle of the road as far as intensity goes from a structural point of view, but over intense as far as flavor and um, personality would go. 
Um, it's not that huge monster wine that you're just trying to get your head around. Everything about this, from the aromas that come out of the glass to the um, just the red, bright cherries, the milk chocolate, the intensity of the wine is just is perfect for for what I would like to describe. And it's coming right into that time frame. 14 was a great year. 12 and 13, um, 2012 was a year where we got hit with just major heat spikes um, right at the end of the season. Those multiple days of 100 plus degree weather and the fruit just, it's got very little that it can offer. The plants pretty much shriveled up and can't really help it anymore. So the, the, the grapes are very vulnerable at that point and they, can actually start to raisin, so you have to get it off of there. And so you ended up with these wines that were extracted, very intense, and they were a little nutrient deficient because the plant, at a certain point, will actually start to try to pull things back from the grapes so it can survive. And so it's a little bit of a game with the fruit versus the plant. So we got these wines in, and, then, and they were just deficient in nutrients. The fermentations were difficult. Um, but made great wines in the end. But we learned in 13, very similar to 12, but we were more prepared. 14 was a little bit more of a relief. It was more of a balanced year. It was a winemaker's year. You know, some years we call it a, you know, either Mother Nature's taking the game and holding the ball and running with it, and some years you get to hold the ball and run with it. 14 was a very good year, um, you know, for us to be able to make some very brilliant balanced wines. And to me, this is showing exactly that way. Um, this vineyard is called Annapurna. So a little background on Annapurna is Annapurna was a vineyard that actually was used by the shapers um, in their hillside, hillside select program. Um, Susie and I were very lucky that we were able to take this lease over. I'm going to say, gosh, maybe 16, 18, 16 to 18 years ago and uh, work with a gentleman named Vinod Gupta, who owns the property, we just lease it. Um, and we've had a great relationship ever since. Um, we make a Merlot from this property as well, that we're not tasting right now, but our Merlot is fantastic. The bad news on that is 2017, which is released already, um, is the last year for that Merlot from it from the Annapurna Vineyard. We will continue to make Merlot here at Reynolds, and I think I've got some pretty killer stuff coming down the pipeline. Um, it's just not gonna be Stag's Leap Merlot. And I know that's a disappointment. There's a lot of people um, that have tried it and hit me up all the time. I need to get some more, I need to get some more. It's kind of the last call for that. So uh, just giving you a little word of warning on that. So that would be Neville. That would be Neville. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, you have um, Brad Sears from hey. and Rebecca in Raleigh. Hey Nicole. guys, North Carolina folk. They're drinking some ass ass Sauvignon Blanc. It looks like with you. So. Oh, right on, right on. <laughs> How are you guys? I mean, I miss coming out. I mean, I one thing I will say is, you know, when you're a road warrior like I've been, slinging a bag of wine for all these years, um, you know, you kind of develop these friendships on the road and and. Uh, I, I miss all my states. I miss going out on the road, and I'm looking forward to getting back out there. Uh, North Carolina, as my kids will even tell you, is a special place for us. Um, of all the places in the United States that my kids of all, every one of all three of my kids, Cameron, who just graduated Cal Poly, Rebecca, who's at Davis, and Sarah, who's still in high school here, but considering schools, every one of my kids has said, Hey dad, I want to go look at schools in North Carolina. And I think it's because they hear me coming home all the time saying what a beautiful state it is and how much it reminds me of California with the coast. Um, I think for my daughter, Sarah, she's probably liking it just because of that new series called Outer Banks. that's really hip on Netflix. I don't know if you've seen it. Well, I'll have to watch that one. I was yeah. looking for a new series. Well, it's a bunch of, you know, hip teenage surfer kids, but it is pretty cool, actually. <laughs> so, uh, well, actually, I saw the preview for that one. Yeah, it is pretty good. So anyway, um, so we'll talk a little bit more um, before we wrap this up. I don't know if there's any more questions, but um, we have a full lineup 
you guys, I know a lot of you know them. Um, today, we're only tasting these four wines. The next time we get together, we're probably going to be tasting some of our new releases. We're going to start announcing those and actually have this kind of a virtual tasting for those. I think one thing this COVID thing has done in this lockdown is um, I've learned that there are actually cameras you can use on computers. Pretty amazing. Um, yeah. <laughs> I've learned what Zoom means. Um, some days it feels like a four-letter word, but nonetheless. <laughs> um, <laughs> Anyway, so I think we're going to try to uh, start to put out some more of these things later um, as we release some wines this summer. Um, we thought this would probably be our last one of these um, live just because people are starting to get out now and maybe this stuff is starting to dry up a little bit. Um, we'll look forward to your comments and things going forward. And if there's requests for this, happy to get back out and share an hour with you and talk a little more about wine. Um, but I appreciate, I know Susie, all of us here at Reynolds Family Winery, appreciate all the support we've gotten over the years from everybody. We have the most amazing wine club members. Um, I can't even thank you enough. And um, anyway, we look forward to you guys coming to see us out here in California because we are open. We are open. So you can come sit by the pond. Um we're pretty much all dialed in. We we're even having custom Reynolds masks made that should be here next week. So, you know, just in case you need a souvenir or I don't know, Halloween or something, who knows what you're going to need. Halloween <laughs> at this point. But uh, any last questions, James? Are we about to wrap this up? Well, I just want to make sure that we say uh, thanks to all of our guests. You know, Mike and Lisa Mayer uh, tuning in from Houston. We got Brad and Rebecca from. Uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, of course, the Percivals, Jonathan, some great uh, participation on the uh, chat board today. Awesome. Thanks, you guys. You know, uh, again, you know, everyone you just mentioned um, are those people I talk about out on the road that are always there to support us, um, have shared a few hangovers with me on the road. Speaking of which, um, I think it's only appropriate that we cleanse our palate from the end of this. What do you think? Oh, well, yes. All right. And one of the things, too, I know it's been brought up by a couple people you just mentioned. Um, we're happy to do some in-home dinners, too, guys. So uh, you have some events coming up this summer. Why distributors are slow in restaurants. If anybody wants to do a Reynolds in-home dinner, let's talk. Send us a little note. Um, I'd like to thank Ed, Paul, James, all the guys here that are, are helping me out doing this little video. Thank you, guys. And uh, that's about it. I think we're going to wrap it up. Anything you want to say, Paul? I think we're good. Anything from you, James, before we wrap it up? Nope. Another, another great uh, a great time with our members and our guests. All right. Sounds good. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Thanks for supporting Reynolds Family Winery and Pensa Tequila. Cheers, everybody.